Yes, I am Jane Duncan Rogers and I call myself a life, death and small business coach. Usually people don't bring that word in, that little word beginning with D and ending with H, but uh, it's part of my um, mission in life now to make that a lot more comfortable for people. So tonight I am going to start my talk with a reading from my book, Gifted by Grief. It's, in fact, I'm going to be reading short readings from it, um, well, three of them throughout the evening, but I'm going to start off with the prologue, which sets the scene for the things that have happened in the last four years, but five years now. October 2010. Philip didn't soften the blow. It's stomach cancer. What? I felt my body go cold all over. And I sat down suddenly. I wished I was with him at home, instead of on the end of a phone miles away in London. No, really? Yes, the consultant told me they found traces of it in the lining of my stomach. Oh God! What happens next then? Immediately, I was into trying to get the problem solved even though I was so shocked that I didn't really take it all in. This kind of announcement is one of those things you think only ever happens to other people. But devastatingly, here it was now, in our own lives. Later that night, I came through the gate at Inverness Airport and I saw Philip waiting for me. Is it really true? I whispered, nestling into his tall, strong body. It, it didn't seem possible. I'm afraid so. I can't believe it. Somewhere on that plane trip, I'd been desperately hoping it was all a dream. Philip told me he knew, really, when he got a letter from the hospital earlier that week, saying he should contact them immediately. He'd spoken right away to his daughter Jackie, a nurse. The hospital simply confirmed his worst fear. It confirmed my worst fear too, that he would die and abandon me, leaving me all alone in the world with no husband and no children. Twenty years previously, summer 1990. I know I'm not sure about having children, but I'd at least like to have the choice to have them. I confided to my friend as we sat together on the beach, looking out over the turquoise Aegean Sea, waves gently rolling in. To do that though, I want to have a man to have them with, and my track record isn't great in that department. <laughs> After three months we always break up, mainly because I'm so terrified. What about if I commit to someone and then they leave me? How would I cope? This fear had clearly been a dominating influence in my relationships. Jane, she murmured sympathetically, sounds like you need some help. How about some counselling? I felt the warm sand underneath the soles of my feet. My gaze shifted to the faraway horizon, and in that moment, I began to feel a sense of possibility. That short conversation was the precursor to several months of therapy, during which I pronounced I would commit to the next man I met, who was suitable, to whom I was attracted, and who was attracted to me. Rash, but bold. And it would need to be to counteract the three-month breakup pattern and my fears. <laughs> One autumn morning, sitting in the counsellor's attractive room at her house, I pronounced, I think I'm ready to meet a man now. The thing is, there's no decent ones out there. We had a back and forth conversation about this. <laughs> and at the end of the session, she surprised me by saying something that would change my life forever. I have a friend staying with me who's going to your office today and can give you a lift there. His name's Pradeep, although he calls himself Philip for his work. Pradeep was an unusual name for a white middle-class Englishman, but my counsellor had an odd name too, Vyog. I knew it meant they were both sannyasins, followers of spiritual master Osho, then known as Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. After the end of the session, Vyog called Pradeep's name and a friendly head appeared at the door. Within a few minutes, I was sitting next to him in his car. I was captivated by the air of still presence surrounding this man. I simply wanted to be near him. 
and soak up some of that stillness for myself. Taken aback by this desire, and to cover my nervousness, I chattered the whole of a half hour drive to the office. There, we continued to talk until I protested, I really have to get on with some work now, you must go, and I shepherded Pradeep to the door. Will you have lunch with me today? he asked. No, no, I've already taken my lunch break, I'm having my therapy session. I felt disappointed, but touched by the invitation. Bidding him goodbye at the door, I went to shake his hand. He reached out and hugged me. I felt a bit taken aback. That's a bit forward, I thought. Is this what all sannyasins are like? Still, the hug was lovely, warm and affectionate, and I felt sad saying goodbye. I spent the next couple of hours focusing on work as best I could. Probably didn't get much done. <laughs> Later that afternoon, he rang to invite me to dinner on the following Monday when he would next be in London. Yes! burst out of me, and I scampered down the office corridor, shouting, I've got a date! I've got a date! <laughs> the three-month relationship test came. I knew from previous experience this would be a watershed moment. Despite a week of shouting, arguments, and stomping off on both our parts, I held to my resolve. Sure enough, the pattern was broken, and after that week, we'd made a commitment to each other. I rang my mum in France. I think I've met the man I want to marry, I announced with excitement. Isn't that a bit soon? She sounded worried. <laughs> it's all right, Mum. It'll all be fine. I waved away her fears cheerily. Back to October 2010. When we found out about the cancer, I was catapulted back into that moment with Mum. Now, it wasn't all fine. I was terrified. I feel it too. My worst fear of being without the fabric of belonging, a husband, children, family, seemed like it actually might happen. Was I really going to be all alone in this world? It seemed possible, and yet I had no idea at all that even if I was alone, I would also find myself having received a gift and being grateful for it. This is a quote from Plato, and it says, for to fear death, my friends, is only to think ourselves wise without really being wise. For it is to think that we know what we do not know. For no one knows whether death may not be the greatest good that can happen to man. Pretty challenging. I've never been afraid of death as a concept. I have been intrigued by it, I was interested, and I have read quite a lot, I've studied quite a lot in my professional career as a psychotherapist and counsellor. Um, I, I regarded it as an adventure. Having said that, when it comes to visit, it's not quite the same. <laughs> um, and Philip didn't feel the same way as me. He was. Uh, he was afraid. He was afraid of dying. He was afraid of, well, not knowing, uncertainty. Who really knows? Even if you've had a near-death experience, you can't say for sure that's going to be the same. I've never had one, so I'm not absolutely sure about that. <laughs> um, it was the last thing that we wanted. We didn't. He didn't want to die. I didn't want him to die. Um, but you know, when you get a diagnosis like that, you just get on with living. That's what you do. I'm sure some people here will have had that experience as well, or know somebody who's had that experience. Because when you're alive, you're alive. Right up until the moment when you're not. In whatever shape or form that is. So we got on with him. He started writing a blog. And... That was wonderful because he had been a good writer in the past but hadn't been doing a lot of it. And I was really celebrating this, that he was writing a blog. I started madly writing more in my journal, which I'd never stopped. I started keeping a journal in my 20s. And um, we began the journey of living with cancer in our marriage. Um, he had his... He decided to go down the chemo route. He had chemo, well, the plan was chemo and an operation and more chemo. And if the operation got everything out, then he would be fine. So we were quite um, hopeful to start with. 
we fo even though the odds were against us, we focused on the fact that the operation would work, which is understandable. I think most people would do that in the same situation. <clears throat> I wanted to read you a tiny bit from Philip's blog, um, just so that you get a, a taste of his voice in all this as well. Um, so this was about two months after he had been diagnosed, and this is Philip's voice. I'm shocked by how little I've been able to share in 10 days since I had my first chemo drip. I've been wanting to tell you about my new mate Lanky ever since I met him. We became inseparable straight away. You know how it is with some people you meet? You just click, fit together smoothly. So it was with Lanky. We went everywhere together for the following for the following 12 hours, couldn't be, couldn't be parted. Sometimes I had to go somewhere he could get refreshment, recharge his batteries, but apart from that, we were free to roam about together. Thank God for Lanky. That's his blog. This is Lanky. This is the drip that he was hooked up to. Because of Lanky, I could escape the ubiquitous televisions blaring in every room and get some semblance of peace. If you're not well, I wouldn't recommend a hospital for rest and recuperation. It was noisy, mostly because of the TVs. I retreated to the comfortable, well-appointed day room, but unfortunately, one of its major furnishings was an enormous TV. Not long sitting there, before two visitors came in, and without so much as a buy your leave, switched the damn thing on. Lanky and I left. <laughs> he doesn't like them either. <laughs> We went and sulked on a chair at the end of the corridor, as far away from everyone as we could get. That's where that photograph is taken. <laughs> I suppose I should mention that all this time Lanky was supporting me in a specific way, that is, carrying the bags of various liquids that were dripping into me through the IV. Sometimes he managed to get a bit tangled up the cables and drip lines, but mostly he did a great job. He was very discreet in the loo, he turned the other way. <laughs> So thanks, mate, but I have to say, I feel a bit ambivalent about you looking back. Now I've had a bit of space, I'm not so sure you were a good influence. The days after we were together were like the worst hangover I've ever had. Sick as a dog, and never a drop or gram past my lips. Not even any drunken, half-remember carousing to regret, to balance it out a bit. We'll be together again for the day quite soon, too. I should be polite, of course, but definitely hold a bit of English reserve this time round. I let myself go a bit, looking back. Got too familiar, too trusting. Let you a bit close for comfort, in truth. You carry some powerful medicine, man, but you're not what you seem. I'm going to be a bit more careful second time round. Well, as you know, Lanky and uh, the contents of Lanky didn't work in the end. It didn't work to keep the body alive, and um, it became clear that the operation hadn't worked either, and we were going to be facing Philip's death probably within a matter of months. Um, actually, I asked how long it might be. I never told Philip that. He didn't want to know. And what can the consultants say? The, the truth is, they don't know either, really. But he did say he thought it would be a matter of months rather than years. So Philip was in hospital for six weeks before he, uh, and he died in hospital. And one of the a wonderful things that happened in that time was, it happened in the last maybe couple of weeks. You know, when somebody's dying, you don't know when they're going to die. So I'm saying this, it was in the last couple of weeks, but I didn't know it was going to be a couple of weeks then. Then you're living in the moment. You don't know what's going to happen when, so you're just there right now. And one of the beautiful things that happened was that we realised that when we said I love you to each other, it didn't feel quite right anymore. We didn't feel like there was an I here and a you there to love each other. We felt instead that we were being visited by love. Love's presence, let's say. And we were basking in it. And 
That was amazing. It was really very beautiful and very tender. In amongst a time that wasn't ideal, let's face it. That's an understatement, by the way. <laughs> but this, uh, this moment is one of the moments that I remember and really cherish. I'm very glad that we had that very short conversation. <clears throat> Good, okay. He died. And the reason that I've got an empty bag up there is because I was sitting there with him. Um, he'd had a difficult night the night before. I will tell you a little story about that because it's really interesting, I think, about how people know when they're actually going to go. I had done, I, I knew about this. I knew to listen out for a message. Because often people who are quite close to the end will communicate something that is meaningful perhaps only to the nearest and dearest. And what happened, uh, and it was the night before he actually died, um, I had been sleeping in the hospital when my friend had been with him that night. But she texted for me to come up in the middle of the night and um, she told me that he had said he wanted to watch the television. Now, having been such a fan of television, <laughs> he actually <laughs> wanted apparently to watch the television. But he wanted to watch Countdown. Do you know that program, mm -hmm. Countdown? When he said that, which was one of his favourite programmes, I knew that he was telling me that he was counting down. I just knew it. I just knew it in my bones that the message was, I'm counting down, time to go. He then did watch it, they couldn't find it on, on the telly, and he lost interest. So for me that was very important. Um, He had been lying in the bed for some while um, with this horrible sound in the throat. Some of you will know that, yeah. And um, at one point the nurses shifted him, his position and the breathing changed. And at this point I was there with me, myself and, uh, oh God, I was going to say my husband. It wasn't my husband. It was a friend, a male friend of ours. And... Um, and another, uh, another good friend, uh, Barbara, and I was just sitting there holding his hand and he was taking a breath and then there was a long gap. Some of you are nodding, yeah. And the thing about that is you don't know when is the last breath until after it's happened, because then another one doesn't happen. And what I noticed was a change in the colour in his face, very, very subtle. But more than that, within a few minutes, less than a few minutes, what I was looking at was an empty bag. And I know, I knew about this, I read about it, I'd seen other dead people. I hadn't actually seen someone dying before, but for some reason it hit me more strongly this time. And I was completely disinterested in the body from that point onwards. Not interested at all. I'm saying that now because it was really important a bit later on. Because immediately, almost immediately, um, I uh, was plunged into grief. Um, in all its different forms. Um, one thing that helped me was the knowing about the so-called stages of grief. Anybody here heard about the stages of grief? Yeah, stages of death, or, okay, some people have. There's some controversy about whether these actually exist or not. <laughs> um, what I knew about them is that they are not like a nice, neat curve of going from one to the other. They are a big mess like that. And that was very helpful because it provided context for anything. It didn't matter what I was feeling anything was okay and that was really important, really important for me to know because it meant that I didn't suppress anything. So I got pretty good at crying in odd moments, like in Marks and Spencer's one day, the first time probably I was in, my, uh, in, a, in a clothes shop and I didn't have to go to the men's department. It was awful. I just, 
tears just came and I had to leave. And that's how I discovered that people don't notice if you're in a shop and you're crying. <laughs> Generally speaking, they're not going to notice, not unless you're really bawling. I wasn't really bawling, but I did have a lot of tears. Um, yeah, another reading here, because I discovered that people really don't know, generally speaking, people don't know how to be around somebody who's grieving. And I wanted just to read uh, some of the things, some of the comments that people made to me. Now, you know, you may not know, I live in the, uh, in the wider community associated with the Pintuan Foundation. Arguably, up there, there's quite a lot of people who are relatively speaking aware compared to the general public. And it doesn't appear to make any difference. <laughs> That's not quite true, because I had a lot of friends who were incredibly supportive. Okay. I never knew before how very important a card, email, text or phone call could be. Or a hug without words. Or just someone's presence. I was surprised by who sent cards. Some were from people I hadn't known knew Philip or from those whose our lives had only briefly touched. I was also surprised by who didn't send cards or acknowledge his death in any way. This was my first introduction to how odd some people are around death. I quickly learned how much I appreciated it when someone we had known said something to acknowledge what had happened. It didn't matter what, even if it was, I don't know what to say. It's true. It is hard to know what to say, especially if you're just an acquaintance. Someone shook my hand. Please accept my condolences. Very formal. Fine on a card, but it sounded really odd spoken out loud. So sorry you lost Philip, said someone else. I thought, thank you, but it's me who's lost, not him. That's my beliefs there. So I'm not saying that so sorry you, you have lost someone is a bad thing to say, but that's how it affected me. Another acquaintance approached and expressed how sorry he was and then went on to tell me how he knew how I felt as his father had just died. Inside my head, I screamed, your father? And you like an actual losing my husband for God's sake. On the outside though, I just nodded my thanks. And then someone else announced, you're very accident prone, you know. What? What have I done? I was really shocked. Had I caused an accident somehow and not even realised it? No, no, I mean you're likely to have an accident. It's well known that people who are bereaved are accident prone. So be very careful driving. Better not to drive at all, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is someone I hardly knew. By now, though, I understood that people do say odd things when all they're really wanting to do is help in some way. So I politely accepted what he was saying and then ignored it. How could he know how utterly unhelpful it was to be told this and on top of it not to drive? <laughs> how could he know it would make me feel like punching him? <laughs> I listened politely to him expand his views while all the time paying no attention in my head. It was almost laughable. Later, I told this story to a trusted friend who exclaimed exasperatedly, Jane, you are not accident prone. If people are not able to feel or process their feelings, then they may well be accident prone, but you don't fall into that category and you aren't. Even in one of my spiritual group meetings, someone said, when you and Philip were there the last time we met, you were asking for healing and prayers and I couldn't give the healing because I knew Philip wasn't going to make it. In my journal, I wrote, God, who in their right mind thinks that is a useful or sensible thing to say to someone newly bereaved? For goodness sake, people are so weird, so weird. <laughs> Moral of the story. Mm -hmm. When you meet someone whose loved one has died, do acknowledge it, but keep it simple. You have no idea how that person is going to be processing what's going on. Simple words or a gesture is fine. Even saying, I don't know what to say and then keeping silent worked really well for me. Just a card, email, a text, any form of communication really will do. It's the non-acknowledgement that really hurts.
So I just wanted to say that this, uh, this, all of that that I've just read out there about how to be around somebody who's grieving, it applies to all kinds of loss, not just somebody who's bereaved. So for example, if you've been recently divorced, or even not recently, but a while ago, it's a bit more difficult because people don't necessarily know. Mind you, they don't necessarily know if somebody's died either. And I began to wish that I'd have the Victorian black armband on so that people would know somehow that, you know, to be careful. And that I was extra sensitive. Um, but there are many, many different kinds of losses and the most important thing is the acknowledgement of them. Because otherwise it becomes like an elephant in the room and if you're around somebody like me, the per that person is going to start talking about the elephant in the room. I can't bear it if there's an elephant in the room, so I'm always encouraging it to come out. <clears throat> the other thing, in that reading, it, when I was reading it out the first time, I realised that it, I was saying something about comparison there, about the, the man who had lost his father had been, um, uh, I was comparing that. And I learned later that some, it doesn't matter who it is, you can't, the, the amount of grief or the intensity or whatever it is can, isn't to do with the relationship that you have with them. It could be your father, it could be your lover, it could be your child, I don't know. They can't be compared, that's really my message. Each one of them is as awful as all the others to the person who's feeling it. And that's really important to acknowledge as well. A mantra that I had been using already, that I had put together, stop, be still, listen, and only then act. I've been using that, and very successfully as well, from the point of view of being a human being, even while thinking that I wasn't. <laughs> but now I was using it in a very different way, because I didn't need, I, I, I I was focusing more on, or its stillness was more present. Still had to stop, because the human being likes to go, as you probably know. The human being likes to go really fast, and think fast, especially in my case, a lot of fast thinking. <laughs> um, but this is the kind of thing that you, for example, Alison, have talked about, I know, because you, you because I know Alison quite well, and maybe a few other people here will understand. When you are operating from, no, let's put it another way. When actions and operations are happening from stillness, they may look completely the same, but the results are very likely to be different. Or sometimes the results are the same, but the experience of them will be different. And this was a great gift for me, really a great gift, and still is a great gift. It, it's it's. Um, Yeah, it's basically why I was ended up being able to say that I was grateful for Philip having died, which I wouldn't have said that to start with, I can tell you, <laughs> but it is also why I ended up calling the book Gifted by Grief, because I felt like I had been given a great gift. There was another gift though, in fact there were a lot of gifts, a lot, and the ones that I've written about in the book are not the ones that I'm about to tell you now. <laughs> Because <laughs> this is another one that has come up. Uh, and this has just been, this is recent, this only happened just before Christmas. <clears throat> In the book, I had written about Barbara, and Barbara is the woman who was with Philip uh, and our other friend when he died. She had emailed some months previously with a long list of questions that she insisted that we answer before he died. And, you know, this wasn't just one email, it was like, she was good at following up. <laughs> she followed up and she said, have you answered the questions yet? Have you answered the questions? These are difficult questions. Things like, what kind of coffin do you want? How do you want your body to be dressed? Who would you like around you as you die? Really quite challenging at the best of times and more difficult if you know it's going to happen soon. So I said to Philip one day, um, let's, uh, okay, we're going to do the questions now. This was in one Saturday morning. We sat up in bed with the laptop. He didn't have a chance. I was determined. <laughs> but you know what? 
I asked him these questions, we discussed them, he gave me his answers, and we ended up having an amazing couple of hours together. Really incredibly intimate, very loving, very connected, and it felt like we, it was our, one of our, well, it felt like it was our last project together. We had been really good at doing projects, mostly they were renovating houses, not this sort of thing, but it had the same feeling to it. And, and um, that, that was wonderful. Now, I wrote about that in chapter 10 in Gifted by Grief. And that's the chapter that people have said to me, oh, that's such a good idea, that is such a good idea. We really need to answer these questions ourselves. And in December, I thought, ah, right, okay. People keep telling me that they need to answer these questions, but they're not doing it. I'm going to see if anybody actually wants to do it. So I put out um, an offer for a workshop in the Fincorn local community in, in Forest, where I live. And I was amazed that it, people signed up immediately and I could have filled it twice over. It seemed that people not only wanted to answer the questions but needed some help to do it and wanted to do it in a group. Um, and that has become the... Uh, let's see if I've got it up here. Yeah. This is my new book, a PDF copy of which I have, but I've left it in the, in the room, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> before I go, practical questions to ask and answer before you die. It will become a, a proper book. Um, it's in the process of happening at the moment. Um, these, these, I did loads of research and padded out the questions and you know once you start all this information is out there it's all out there for free people can access it can answer the questions themselves but guess what they don't do it in fact i'll just ask you here how many of you have even got a will hands up who's got a will that's not bad <laughs> half the room <laughs> these questions do include the legal stuff as well and that's not just a will, but a power of attorney and, and um, a living will. But, you know, legal stuff is like, no, don't want to look at legal stuff. Which is one reason people don't do it. But there's lots more. When you start to think about it, when you start to be wanting to consciously approach the fact that actually you are going to die one day. Sorry to tell you folks, but it is going to happen. <laughs> don't know when, that's the only thing. But answering these questions before you know when is really important because you might not get a chance. I don't, uh, you know, it, 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 the statistics show that it's very likely that you are going to last for a long time <laughs> and that you will have a, it, you won't be dying suddenly. However, just the other day, a colleague of ours uh, posted on Facebook about, in a Facebook group, about the shock she had felt when she had told that one of her friends, who was only in her 50s, had suddenly died. And her mum was going frantic because she couldn't tell anybody because her phone was locked with all her contacts in. She didn't have any other contacts, way of contacting them. Um, and she didn't know the password. It's like, things like this we don't think about. So, um, really important to answer those questions and that has now become primarily the work that I'm doing now is facilitating people to do that either one-to-one -one or in groups. I do also work with people who are, are grieving but even I thought that would happen. I thought, you know, people would come to me wanting that but that's not what's happening and I'm now willing to follow where the energy is and the energy has been around this. Um, and it takes me back to my days when I used to do Louise Hay workshops. I, I trained with Louise Hay in 1990 in America and when I came back here I was the first person in Europe to do those groups. And in those days there was almost nobody else doing them, you know, it was fantastic. There was no internet either. I went, uh, I, I went to places where I knew people. In fact, I came up to Edinburgh and stayed with my friend Linda here. I, I decided to go and do groups where I could go and stay with my friends. <laughs> And that's what I did for about 10 years. Um, and the groups that I've been doing now have taken me back to that time and shown me how much I really do enjoy doing face-to-face -face groups and 
they got mine as well. I do like a bit of face to face. <laughs> and I brought us back here to the quote, the end of the quote from Plato: "For no one knows whether death may not be the greatest good that can happen to man, because love knows no boundaries." And I feel like my experience around death has been one of love knowing no boundaries whatsoever. It come, comes back to that language thing again. We could easily call the stillness to silence love. It's not the kind of personal love that you feel between yourself and your partner. That's part of this bigger love, let's say. I think Robert Holden calls it big love. I think it's that. So, and these are some of the things that have been a gift, and you can't see all that, but I've, um, there are the books, Gifts by Grief, Before I Go, The Light in the End of the Tunnel, and discovering that there is no light at the end of the tunnel because the light's already here. <laughs> and it's only the thinking that we're in the tunnel that gets us into trouble. Um, the stillness and the silence, because of course the stillness and the silence is still really valuable. I still do that, I still meditate and calm my mind and all the rest of it, because that's all absolutely valid in its own right. Okay, Dave, thank, thank you so much.